Amen. Amen. I would just uh, like to draw your attention to the fact that I kneeled while I was praying again. Some have freaked out a little bit that I haven't done that every week. And I wanted you to, I wanted you to hear my line. This is my line. So when someone goes, why aren't you kneeling? Here's my line. Why are you peeking? <laughs> Am I right? Because like, I just want you to know, I mean, so exhale, I'm still a Christian. Okay. <laughs> And there's multiple postures that you can exhibit when you pray, including apparently opening your eyes. <laughs> and so sometimes I'll stand and sometimes I'll kneel and sometimes it's good to see that I don't do the same thing every time because we get into kind of a rote expectation and it's the posture of heart that matters, right? Okay. So it's great to pray and I'm trusting the Lord to do work today and I'm totally fine that you guys are peeking, so... 2 Samuel 6, what a text, what a text. Let me start in verse 1, I'm going to read down to the end of the chapter, this is the word of the Lord for this morning. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might was wearing a linen ephod. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Mishal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished the offering, the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed each to his house and David returned to bless his household. But Mashal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, hmm, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering for himself today or uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Mishal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I shall be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Mashal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You can be seated. Well, church, good morning. And what a week has it been, huh? What a thanksgiving we should be giving to the Lord today. Man. We just had 
an enormous amount of kids here this week, and I'm just so thankful. We have a, um, an amazing team. Uh, Denise, Mandy, Mary leading everything that was going on. We are so blessed. We had Moses who was teaching every single day, and just to see Moses' gifts at work, not M- Moses, but a different Mo- Anyway, so at work, teaching these kids so faithfully, so well. It was just, and then there's multitudes of servants, right? And some of you have your shirts on. Praise God for you. Some of you are too cool to wear your shirts to church, which is fine. No judgment here. And then others, let's just be really honest. Maybe that's a small category. The big one is it's so stinky from the week. Come on, you didn't even get it through the washer dryer, so you couldn't wear it today. Or that Shekinah glory of smell would be coming off of you, and you decided to spare us of that, and we appreciate that very much. But what a week, right? And then speaking of kids, Roe v. Wade, come on. Yes. Thank you, God. Wow. What? Man, that just goes to show, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying, Christian. Because by the way, as exciting as this is, it's not going to get better in California. It's going to get worse. So there's two things about that. Number one, this is the mission field. Don't hate the ones you're ministering to, right? Don't have this anger and animosity that's projected out towards the very mission field we're supposed to be ministering to. So we need a high level of clarity about what abortion is and not being uh, afraid to say that it is, it's murder, right? And at the same time, being able to compassionately come alongside people, preach the gospel, share the compassion of Jesus with those who desperately need it. So our compassion should ramp up and our clarity should ramp up. And if you're kind of going, man, I'm still stuck here in California, uh, well, we're smack dab in the middle of the missions field. So consider yourself sent to this area to bring glory to Jesus as we bring compassion and clarity to those who need it. Amen? Let's be those people, okay? And then the last thing I would just say is I'm so excited for tonight. We have our first church planning meeting for Max and uh, those that are excited to go to Folsom. And if you want to just come and check it out tonight, it's just kind of a, I don't know, it's an epic moment in our church's history. And we're going to get it uh, videoed or recorded or whatever you want to say. And so if you miss it, we'll get you that. And, uh, and people have been asking me, hey, uh, when's, when are you going to get out of the pulpit so we can listen to Max, all right? He's the new thing. He's the shiny toy. When are we going to get some of that, all right? July 10th, he will be here preaching for us, okay? So mark it, come back, heckle him, just like you did with me at the beginning. No, I'm just kidding. Just encourage him, and that's going to be an awesome, awesome time. So we're looking forward to that. Okay, all right. Whew, I did all of that. Now we got a passage in front of us, my goodness. Title of the message this morning is Living Coram Deo. Okay? A little shout out to the future Eden Classical Academy in the house. Some Latin usage right out the gates. What in the world does Coram Deo mean? If you were a public school kid like me, the only Latin phrase you ever learned was carpe diem. Okay? So if I say that today, just know he meant Coram Deo. It's just the only Latin phrase that I learned. Coram Deo is a Latin phrase that means in the presence of God. In fact, Coram Deo is probably one of the best ways to describe the essence of the Christian life. That your life, the way you need to see your life, is lived in the presence of, under the authority of, and to the glory of God, that's how you're to live. So Coram Deo is actually a great way to say, okay, God, help me understand where I'm not living as if I were living in your presence, under your authority, to your glory, because that's the way I want to do it. Now you say, how does living Coram Deo in the presence of God play into chapter 6? I'm so glad you asked. This chapter is all about the return of the ark to Jerusalem. Now, I get it. It's holy furniture. We read about it in the Old Testament, and we may miss the significance of the ark returning to Jerusalem. But let me just remind you a little bit about this 4 by 2 by 2 box, okay? That happens to be plated with gold, that happens to have a seat on it that's plated in gold, that happens to have cherubim that are designed, that are looking in towards the mercy seat, that are plated in gold, that, that has this 
amazing design to it, but what it's there and what it signifies is what's so important about it, and it's this. Yahweh's presence was signified by the ark. The ark returning to Jerusalem is the presence of God returning to its central place among the people of God. So integral or connected in its signifying of the presence of God that the ark had that when the ark set out to lead Israel, Moses would say, as in Numbers 10, 35, advance, O Lord. So the box goes, and Moses is declaring, advance, O Lord, and scatter your enemies. And when the ark would be set down in the next place, Moses would say, return, O Lord, you who are Israel's myriads of thousands. If you go all the way back, we haven't even had an ark sighting yet, have we, in 2 Samuel? you got to go all the way back to our time in 1 Samuel, where, you remember who picked it off from the Israelites? The Philistines picked it off, right? And when it was taken, here's what 1 Samuel 4.22 says, the glory has departed from Israel. Or the phrase you would know is Ichabod, glory departed. The glory has departed from Israel. Listen why. Listen, listen to how this goes. For the ark has been captured. The ark goes, glory goes. The ark goes, presence of God goes. And so what we have today is that this chapter is the reverse of what happened at Aphek in 1 Samuel chapter 4 when the ark was taken. Now the ark returns, and it's this amazing new creation kind of moment in Jerusalem, which is quite significant. Glory of God was out, had departed. The ark is reestablished in the city of Jerusalem, in its center for the nation, right where it should be. New opportunities, new creation language just bursting through here. Here's what I mean by this. When you are not a believer, the presence and glory of God is not central in your life, right? Glory has departed, and you are under the judgment of the glory departing because of your sin. But when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, what happens? Glory enters through the Spirit of God dwelling in your heart by faith, causing you to be born again and to repent and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And it says that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. This is the work of God when he becomes central in your life. And what we look forward to for those who have placed their faith in Jesus is a new heavens and a new earth where we will not need a sun because the glory of God will be so profound, it will light up that place and the new Jerusalem will be centered on God's glory. And we are the new Jerusalem if you trust in Jesus. That's awesome. That's what's going on here as we see it in its Old Testament, Second Samuel form that is paving the way, a sign of greater things to come. Bringing the ark to Zion, David is saying that Yahweh's presence must no longer be peripheral and absent, but central and present in Israel's life. In other words, Israel's life must be lived coram Deo. We got to get back to it. We got to get back to Jesus central, Jesus first, Jesus best, Jesus most, and as Israel should be called to live Coram Deo, so should you. This is a return for us to say, is Jesus first? Because here's what happens in a Christian's life, right? You're like, Jesus first, Jesus first. And then if we're honest, Jesus first, like on a Sunday morning, Jesus first, like when you go to small group, the times you go. But then, but, but when Jesus isn't advantageous to live for, something else happens, you go, Jesus on the second seat, me first, and then Jesus back on the seat. And this is saying, no, Coram Deo is a all of life reality. All of it under the authority of, to the glory of, before the presence of Jesus. So here's the big idea for this morning. A life lived Coram Deo before the presence of God, returns to living centered on the glory of Jesus in whom the ark has its fulfillment. A life lived Coram Deo returns to living centered on the glory of Jesus for you guys. New covenant, 
post-New Covenant folks, in whom the ark finds its fulfillment. The ark finds its fulfillment in Jesus. See, what, what's so interesting about the ark, and we have to see this, is that Jesus fulfills all that the ark signifies. So I'll give it to you in three major categories. If you zoom into the ark, you have the prophetic presence of God in the ark. What do I mean? Pop open that box, and what's inside the box? The law. The covenantal commands of our God, right? Speaking prophetically to his people, this is what it looks like to walk in right relationship to me. But additionally to that, the box was also the place where Yahweh was going to give additional instruction prophetically to Moses on behalf of his people, right? That's what we read about in the book of Exodus. Zoom out a little bit and you move from the prophetic presence of of the box to the priestly presence of the box. What happens with the box? One time a year, on one specific day, none other than the high priest on the day of atonement goes to present the sin offering, the blood of the sin offering, and would sprinkle it on the top of the box and in front of the box, like Leviticus 16 tells us. So there's a priestly dynamic dealing with the issue of our sins or the sins of God's people in the Old Testament to be specific. And then if you zoomed out a little bit more, that box, the ark, has a representation or signifying the kingly presence of Yahweh, such that 1 Chronicles 28.2 calls the ark Yahweh's footstool. Listen, kings sit on thrones and they put their feet on footstools. The ark is the place of the footstool of Yahweh. Now, when you think about that, prophetic presence, priestly presence, and kingly presence, you watch and see that all of those things are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me explain this to you. As the ark represents Yahweh's prophetic presence, so Jesus is our prophet who reveals to us by his word and spirit the will of God as the son of God for our salvation, life, and godliness. As the ark represents Yahweh's priestly presence, so Jesus is our priest and is himself the sacrifice who brought his own blood into the sanctuary of God, thus securing an eternal redemption. That's Hebrews 9, 12. And as the ark represents Yahweh's kingly presence, so Jesus is our king ruling, defending, and protecting us such that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him so that we would go and make disciples giving him the glory as people are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching those to observe all that he has commanded. So it should be no surprise if we know God's word and we see the fulfillment of the ark in Jesus that the ark, which so fully signifies the presence of Yahweh, would be fulfilled in Jesus, who in him all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. That's Colossians 2, 9. This is profound. You get right with God by getting right with Jesus. Jesus is right in your life when he's central in your life. And then you will be living quorum Deo as if before the presence of God. Now, specifically, I want to break down because the text does. What does that look like? And it's two rhythms to your life. Okay, Christian? Two rhythms to understanding how do you live Coram Deo. How do you live as in all things before the presence of God? Two things. One, a Coram Deo life is one of holy reverence. Second, a Coram Deo life is one of humble rejoicing. Two pedals to a bike. You dive into the holiness of God, rejoicing goes up. You rejoice, you see the holiness of God. It goes back and forth. They're tied together. This is the link that we'll see in verse 12a. Two attempts to bring up the ark, two drumbeats of the Coram Deo life. Let's start with the first one. Number one, a Coram Deo life is one of holy reverence. Now, I kind of have to ask this because... In our modern American context, I'm not even sure if we have a place for this point that is up here. Like, I'm not sure if we can even go to church anymore and have a profoundly um, focused service on the holiness of God. 
Or like if there was like a summer list of like, hey, here's the subjects being preached in the summer and this week's on the love of God and this week's on the grace of God, like going to that week, going to that week, and this one's on fearing God. Vacation, and then this one, right? We, we don't even have a place for fearing God. We can't talk about the fear of God because that's offensive. You certainly wouldn't want to be caught dead bringing a lost person with you on the week that we're talking about the fear of God. Oh, that's today. And I, I will say this, I will say, listen, like, sometimes it's hard, and Christians spin their wheels a little bit on the fear of God. I mean, well, we're not supposed to be, like, totally, like, freaked out about him, but I guess kind of freaked out, and I, it's, like, it's, like, hard to understand what's going on. And I remember having that same issue, and when I was in first semester in seminary, one of my professors, on an off-cuff comment, gave me something that kind of cut through the clarity on what it means to fear God, and we need it restored to the church, and he said, it's, if you look at scripture in the Old Testament, here's how you can define fearing God in one sentence. You fear God by keeping his commandments. Now, it may not be profound to you, but in that moment, it finally cut through all of this. I mean, it means, and it's kind of, and there's reverence, and there's awe, and there's terror, and there's, but not too terror. It just means you remain close to God. You fear God. doesn't mean you run from him. It means you lean into him so at every word you're hanging on it and obeying. He goes, you follow that through the Old Testament, you'll find that is one of the easiest ways to describe the fear of God by keeping his commandments. We'll see how that plays out as we keep going in the story. Chapter 5 ends, David's triumph over the Philistines. How many battles did he win in chapter 5? Dose, can't remember, it was two, one and then another. Remember, he inquired of the Lord, he said, go up, next time inquire of the Lord, and you're going to hear marching on the treetops. Two times. There's a unique period of Israel's life going on right now. There is military stability, there is political stability, there is social stability, because David, all the, the kingdom's been united, everyone's under David's reign, David's reign is going quite successful, we talked about that last week. And so we're getting to a place where, in accordance with the law of God in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 12, 11, God said, when you're given rest from your enemies around, then to the place the Lord will choose, set his name. And so this is, a, in a sense, what that should look like. So David has this huge gathering. They're going to set the name smack dab in the city of David in Zion. What does that mean? They're going to bring the presence of God back to the center of the people of God in the city of Jerusalem, and so he gets the army there. Verse one, big old army, because you're going to get the ark back. You might have some problems, and so David arose and went, and they bring up the ark, right? It's been in exile for 70 years, ark exile. Where the presence of God was absent and peripheral, not central. And so this is a massive moment. Remember, Ichabod means glory departed. Where Ichabod is, judgment is. Where Ichabod is removed and reversed and presence is there, blessing goes forth, right? If you're living apart from Jesus Christ, you're living an Ichabod life. You are living a glory departed life. Image bearer of God, yes you are. But you have missed the centrality of Jesus and he is the one for whom you exist and the one to whom you are to submit to in glad obedience. And apart from a faith in Jesus Christ, you are living that Ichabod, that God on the peripheral or non-existent, just completely absent. And this is a call, this is even a pleading with you to return to Jesus, the co-creator who made you, who lived for you, who died for you, to pay for your sins, who rose for you to conquer Satan's sin and death for those who would put their faith in him. This is huge. Ichabod reversed. Celebration comes. They're carrying the cart, they're, or the, the ark. They're driving on a cart, and here's what verse 5 says. David and all the house of Israel were celebrating Coram Deo before the Lord. That's our phrase, right? They're celebrating before the Lord. Coram Deo. Deo, holy jam sesh taking place. I mean, and they got it all. I, I, someone, I, songs, li lyres, harps, tambourines. I, I didn't know what a castanet was, and everyone's going like this to me, and I'm like, okay, hi. You know, they're like, no, it's this. It's these clappy things. 
How many didn't know what that was, a castanet? Okay, so they're, they're, going, they're going at it. And then cymbals, you know what that is. Anyone who bought their kid a drum set knows what that is, okay? So they're celebrating. This is good. This is a reminder, loved ones, by the way. They could have celebrated in chapter 5 as David was ruling and reigning and things were largely good. Life was secure, but here's a good lesson to learn, and it's easy for us to fall into the temptation of thinking, life is at its best when my life is secure, when it's comfortable, and when everything is going well. That's when we should celebrate! And the text is modeling for us something different. Don't settle for celebrating when your life is comfortable. Celebrate when Jesus is central to your life. That's when you celebrate. When he returns and you see something that you're doing because Jesus is central to your life that you wouldn't do apart from him being central to your life, you celebrate those things. When you repent to your kids because you got upset at them, but then you return to Jesus as Lord over your life and you walk back and you apologize, that's when you should have a party. We celebrate when Jesus is central and at work in someone's life. So did they. Now, we all know where this is going. If you've been around the church at all, we know this story is about Uzzah and touching the ark and being struck down dead, right? What we often fail to understand is the background that gives this text clarity for us to be able to explain it when it makes people upset and seeing the holiness of God on display in this kind of way. So here's what you need to know as we get into the text about Uzzah. Number one, the Old Testament was clear that when the ark was transported, it needed to be covered with the veil of the screen of the tabernacle, okay? Numbers 4, verse 5, and verse 20 was clear. Lest they die, God is giving this warning. Cover the tabernacle lest you die. Number two, the ark was to be carried on the priest's shoulders via the poles that were given specifically for transport. What were they carrying it on? A cart, not a golf cart. Yes, kind of like, like an old wheelbarrow, just, just different, right, than what we're thinking, but not in fulfillment of the scriptures, Number three, the ark was not to be touched lest they die. Numbers 4, 15. Every Israelite worth their salt would have known and all that was expected of them would have been clear. And I would also like to add before we see this that Yahweh's warnings, Yahweh's commands are not unloving. They're oozing with kindness. The same way that it would be the case if I was on a hike with my kids this summer and we get to the peak and one of my kids, if you know my kids, is more likely to be this one that would like to just step up to the edge. And if I were to say, hey, sweetheart, don't take another step or you're going to die, I wouldn't want judgment on myself because that's not a harsh thing to say, even if I use a strong voice to say, wait a minute, don't take another step or you're going to plummet to your dad, loving or unloving. Loving, loving. That is so loving of someone to do that. God is being loving when he goes, listen, my holiness and you and your sinfulness coming into contact with my holiness, you will perish. So follow my word and it will go well with you and my presence will continue with you. Okay, all that being said, the songs are being sung, the instruments are playing. I envision a DJ there somewhere. My brother-in-law is a DJ. I just got a picture of him last night. He's doing his thing at some restaurant, you know, and you know, uh, the turntables, that's the word. I was like, where? Come on, come on. Someone had to answer that for me in the first service. You know the turntable thing? It's like everyone's going, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. You know that sound that the DJ can make and it just stops the music? And the reason why is because when everyone looks over to their right, they see some guy kind of flopping on the ground, gurgling. That party died real quick. Unto his death. Now, It'd be one thing, and we would all be shocked if you were at a party and someone fell down dead and we found out it was a heart attack, right? That would be sad. 
What's really difficult to swallow about this is that uh, we see who's responsible for this death. It says, verse 6, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put, his, put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, obedient or not, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord broke out, was kindled against Uzzah, and listen, God struck him down there because of his anger. Okay, what do we have here? You want to know what we have here? On Uzzah's side, we have good intentions with a defiant morality. Good intentions wrapped up in defiant morality. He's trying to do a noble thing. This, by the way, is where the majority of people who don't know Jesus live right now. They believe they are good people, and they believe they do moral things. This is, this is who we need to share the gospel with. When you get down to it at the end of the day, so the vast, vast majority believe they're a good person. And that, that is good intentions wrapped in a defiant morality. They cannot and they will not submit themselves to the God of the Bible. But they cannot help themselves being image bearers and therefore worshipers. And so they find themselves attaching to religious things and certain convictions and certain morality that is different than the Bible, perverted uh, against what is good, but raised up as that which is good. Is that not the month we're living in right now? It is a good intention wrapped in a defiant morality. And God strikes Uzzah down dead. You know what they say about good intentions, right? The road to hell is paved with them. God help us not live believing so much in our goodness that we will operate under our own morality and refuse to submit to the clarity of the morality of God who sets the standard of morals. But it's not just that he got struck down. That would be more comfortable, right? That would be a God that's more fitting to the American culture. He just happened to fall down dead and then we're left to connect some dots and figure out what's going on. No, 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 it's clear. God struck him down. Are you okay with that? Don't apologize for this God. I feel that's our temptation as Christians, right? This God doesn't fit our modern sensibilities at all. Can you imagine? If this is the week you brought your friend, you know, could you imagine going up? How'd it go? I don't know. Your God's a little bit harsh. I go to other places and he's just projected a bit differently. Uh, uh, oh, okay, well, 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 okay, well, flip to me uh, another passage with me and I'll show you he's, he's love. No, 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 don't, 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 I'm sorry, I'm like, okay, okay, he, he's not, God's not normally like this, okay? Uh, uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Be okay with who God is here. He is holier than thou. One of our biggest problems with this passage is that we radically underestimate the sinfulness of sin. And because we radically underestimate the sinfulness of sin, you and I live with a default of believing grace should be normal and justice is shocking. That we're freaked out when anything like this happens. God forbid he were to step in and take anyone's life. We'd be like, oh! <gasps> I can't believe it. What about grace? What about all this stuff? It's because God is a God of wrath that his love is so clear. God is a God of holiness. And there's great joy in connecting that to rejoicing, which we're going to get to. But this is the God who is revealed in the scriptures. There are people, and I've heard testimonies actually in studying this passage, that have come away seeing God as harsh, that he blows up in anger, that he is having a temper tantrum here. And one of the things I want to just encourage you to do as, you, as a Christian is, is learn to not apologize for God, but explain what's going on here. And if you do that, I think you can help people understand. They may not agree because our God is holier than the God most people have in their mind that they've created. Most people are much more comfortable with the God that they have imagined than the God of the scriptures. But here's the truth, and here's what Augustine said. Augustine said, if we believe only what we want to believe about God and reject what we don't want to believe, then it isn't the Bible we believe but ourselves. 
So it's not like, unfortunately, there, there are places you can go where, where everything is skewed on one side of who God is and doesn't bring in the other side, but God help us to be a church that teaches the full counsel so we get the fullness of God however he's revealed in the scriptures and that we love him for who he's revealed to be. Can we talk about this? Let's explain it. Here's how I would explain it. Number one, you need to understand Uzzah defied God by denying his word. God speaking over his created beings to walk after him and we don't do that is cosmic treason. And because it's the one, uh, because of the one you've sinned against, you deserve to be punished in an eternal way because you were disobeying your eternal Creator. This is far more serious. We we kind of go, what's it, what's the big deal? Well, to God, any issue with undermining His word is a problem. First Chronicles 15 makes sense of what happens here. Because you we didn't seek Him according to His rule, these things happened. You abandon the word of God and you've put yourself in the category of someone who is disobedient, defiant to the Lord. This is what's going on with Uzzah. And I love it. And R.C. Sproul has one of the best messages on 2 Samuel 6. And he so famously said this. He said, quote, Uzzah presumed his hands were cleaner than the mud the ark was in danger of falling into. That is modern man right there. Wrapped up with these good intentions, this defiant morality where they're so wise in their own eyes, they're so prideful. Maybe that is you here. And here's the truth about the Christian life. That's true of every single one of us at one point. I believe the words of Paul Paul were, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is who exists in this place. He goes on, Uzzah believed that mud desecrated the ark. But mud is just dirt and water obeying God. God's law wasn't meant to keep the ark pure from the filth of the ground, but from the filth of human sin, end quote. That is the great miss I was just like, oh, it's, it's stumbling. And so rather than obeying the Lord, he reaches out to do what he shouldn't, carrying it in the way that he shouldn't, and God strikes him down dead. We shouldn't be shocked that judgment happens in these kind of sudden ways as much as we should be shocked that it doesn't happen more often, how much grace God extends to the undeserving But if you're kind of like one of those where you're like, I still don't get it. I'm kind of angry. I feel like that's unjust. He was just doing a good thing. He was trying to be a good person. Again, in defiance to God's word. If you're in the angry spot, let me just say, you're sharing a seat with David. David's missing this connection between the reverence of God and the blessing of God. And we're going to get there. Here's what he says in verse 8. What's David's response? Anger. This is where a lot of people go, right? You try to explain the holiness of God and they get angry. David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Sound familiar, that language? Breaking out? Remember last week, the God of the breakthrough? Turns out God's holiness will level pagans and parishioners who act like pagans. It's no respecter of individuals. Like, well, I go to church. It's like, well, are you walking in defiance of the Lord? Oh, and by the way, um, This isn't like one of those, uh, oh, it's just the Old Testament kind of thing. You you know God off someone uh, in the offering line, right? That was Ananias and Sapphira. When Ananias goes up, and then three hours later, by the way, if you're like, he preaches so long. Okay, they had a three-hour service because he comes in, and God strikes him dead for lying. And then she comes in three hours later. I'm like, okay, I got a lot more time. I got a lot. And then she gets struck down by God. So we're like, oh. The God of the New Testament is nicer. No, the God of the New Testament is the same God of the guys, the God of the Old Testament. And he is just as holy. Oh, it happened in 1 Corinthians 11 as well, when some fools were messing around with communion with selfish hearts and schism, and God offed someone right there on the spot. We should tremble before a holy God. This is nothing new. 
David's response. He's upset. 1 Samuel 6 has a similar response. Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? David says it like this in verse 9. How can the ark of God come to me? And so you know what he does? He makes the choice many people do. You're, you're witnessing to someone. You're trying to share with them about the Lord. And um, they're getting really stuck on a couple key components, attributes of God, like his holiness. And then they just go, you know what? I can't believe in a God who would do X. And so what do they do? They just leave their God discipleship time with you on the side, and they just go on without it. That's exactly what David does. David, all David sees is holiness means bad for me, means cursing. I'm giving it away, and so he ends up giving it to some guy. Stinks to be him, am I right? Gives it to Obed-Edom, the Gittite, the Gentile, because he's like, I don't want any more of this. Forget this. I'm going to leave it here. It's too dangerous. God's presence is dangerous which it is, but listen to what happens. It is in a sense. It says, And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. They're singing, they're partying, Uzzah goes down, dies instantly. David's like, I'm upset about this, about what God did. I dropped this off of this guy's house He's getting blessed nonstop because here's the disconnect people often miss between the holiness of God and our joy is that God's holiness is not meant to push us away from him, but to draw us near to him in the right posture to be with him. And when you're with God in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So there's no disconnect here. He is teaching David this lesson. Holiness, understanding the holiness of God brings us into the proper posture to approach God's presence in a way that will lead to joy, not to destruction. God's presence is meant to be a means of blessing, but God's preparing them to be in that presence the proper way. The ark is left at Obed-Edom's house and the hinge verse is 12a, where it says, it was told King David the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom. So he has this disconnect going on. He had ditched the ark. He was upset about this. He's going, forget this. And then all of a sudden, these worlds come colliding together, and David's reminded again, that's right. God's presence is to bless. God's presence is to bless. God, wait a minute. He's showing us something. He's helping us enjoy him. This isn't to frighten them away. It's to draw them near in holy reverence. There's this aha moment that takes place. We see a little bit of this in 1 Chronicles 16, where it ties these lines of thought together between the reverence we should have towards God and the rejoicing that we should have in God. Here's what it says. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Tremble, rejoice, tremble, rejoice, and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. We are a trembling people before the Lord and we are rejoicing people before the Lord. We tremble because we come into his presence and he is a holy God and it should lead us to a reverential, submissive, humble awe. But in being welcomed into his presence through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we get to enjoy the blessing of God on his people. They get to enjoy the blessing of God on his people. David is seeing this, and he's connecting the dots, and the rejoicing continues. A quorum deo life is not just one of holy reverence, but the second thing is we see true, humble rejoicing taking place. It's changing in David. A quorum deo life is one of humble rejoicing. David is rightly rejoicing. Verse 12, so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. This time we can assume the ark is carried biblically. It doesn't say it, but it's assumed. 
you, can, you can't miss the joy either. Look at this, the rejoicing that happens in verse 12. They're rejoicing. Verse 13, they're sacrificing. This is so awesome. The translation's kind of hard to get, so some people differ on this, but it literally says in my translation, they went one, two, three, four, five, six, and then they sacrificed to the Lord. We're mindful of the fact that they had God's presence with them, and they, God provided a means for them to be right with him in his presence because of a sacrifice. God accepted that sacrifice so they could enjoy God's presence. And then they went another two, three, four, five, six, another sacrifice. Let's take another animal out. Let's celebrate the goodness of God that he has allowed for this sacrifice to, to cover our sins so that we can be in his presence. One, two, three, four. What if you live that way? One, two, three, four, five, six. I just want to take a second to thank God for sending Jesus Christ to die for my sins. Because of him, I am set free from any shame or guilt that I'm feeling today. One, two, three, four, five, six. I just want to thank God for the cross because it's in the cross that I know all my sin has already been forgiven, past, present, and future. So I can walk in today with confidence knowing that God is for me. One, two, three, four, five, six. I celebrate a God who is faithful to his children. How do I know? Because the cross has has spoken and the resurrection has said it's finished right he, he he's not there anymore and so I can testify to that and I can live in that what if we lived that way what if we lived that way the sacrifice is regular because of the holiness of God and just recognizing the glory that he gives us Jesus to be our sacrifice, something to think about. The dancing that takes place. Okay, I did, a, I did an example of this because, I mean, I just got to say, this dancing, it's, it's um, I mean, he's like this. <laughs> That's how it is. It's like the word is a whirling tempest. So you tell me what a whirling tempest looks like when you're dancing. He is dancing like a whirl. That's the word. It's used only one other time in Jeremiah 23 about a whirling tempest. And he is praising. Yahweh, I'm tired <laughs> as I did that. He is praising with, what does it say? All of his might, right? He's dancing so hard. Wow, he's dancing hard. And he's wearing a linen ephod. And he's shouting, and all of this, look at verse 14, all of this is what? Coram Deo, be for the, tell me, Lord. See, here's what I love about, if you understand the holy reverence of God, here's two things we need to avoid then in our culture. The first thing is that holy reverence does not equate to frozen chosen. What is it about this perception amongst Christians that the most angry looking and serious are the most mature. You're like, dude, Jesus is alive. Tell your face. <laughs> Cheer up, won't you? Like, I refuse to move because God is holy. Uh, I would encourage you to move a little bit if the fact that God is holy so astounds you that you can be right with him because of Jesus that your hands happen to do this. Thank you, God. It would be nice if we didn't attribute the most mature to the most angry. God is good. And I'm watching all of you immature people be all like joyful and stuff. Come on. Come on, and that's, that's a little bit in a Bible church, right? I know the Bible so well. Well, like, tell your face and celebrate every once in a while. Jesus is alive. And, and then there's the other side, and this is the one that the mature ones, angry ones, would be on, and it would be this, and it's right. Rejoicing without reverence is another problem in our culture. We just get excited about everything. Hey! everyone, welcome to church, and uh, oh, oh, is that a new iPad coming out? Oh my goodness, a new iPad, everyone's like, yeah, in church fun, everybody, all right, give yourselves a round of applause, that shtick. Holiness without reverence is trivial, it's superficial, it's, it's inaccurate because it's untrue of who God is. 
And it's incomplete because it doesn't tell the whole story. There's joy, but if you're not connecting it to holiness... You're missing the full picture. Psalm 2.11 says it well. We ought to rejoice as a people with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. There is amazing rejoicing going on, but not everyone was feeling this way. There's always someone. It's like, um, you, you remember when you got saved and you were so jacked and you went home to tell somebody or maybe it was a friend and they rained so hard on your parade. Do you remember that? You just marched in there. You're like, Jesus has saved me. And I'm singing, you know, and, and they're like, literally, I paid for your Stanford education so that you could come to a place where you reject all of the smart people's thoughts about evolution and are believing in a God. How did that go so badly? I'm making that up, I don't know. Something like that, right? Where you're just like, the air popped right out of your balloon. The celebration is taking place. David's sacrificing more in verse 13, dances in verse 14. David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord. Michal's looking at this with such an angry eye, sees King David leaping and dancing, and she despises him in her heart. So he's still celebrating, like, hey, the Lord has come, his presence has come, return to Jerusalem, celebrate, this is awesome. God's presence means God's blessing, and look at all the blessing that takes place, right? They dance before the Lord, or excuse me, um, when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people. He distributed all, among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, cakes of bread, portions of meat, cakes of raisins. You see all this blessing, 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 blessing. And he goes back, and it's like leaving church when you're fired up and you're like, I can't wait to get home and tell someone about what I learned about Jesus. And she's sitting there with that just judgy look on their face. You know what I'm talking about? Just that sassy. Mm. And David returned. He was thinking, I'm going to take this blessing that I've been a part of, celebrating the return of God's presence. His presence means blessing. This is awesome. He goes back to Michal, the daughter of Saul. By the way, the text calls her the daughter of Saul in verse 16, 20, and 23, trying to give us a picture of two kingdoms here, two different ways of living. We'll see that in a second. Comes out to meet David, gives him the sh spiel. I call this the sassy spiel. How the, king of, how the king of Israel honored himself today. Kind of had to make this face. Uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants. Just like one of the vulgar fellows so shamelessly does. Or in other words, it's like them, some kingly behavior that was whirling around with that skimpy ephod. <laughs> you think that's how a king acts? You think that's going to put a good vibe out to everybody else that you're acting the proper way? You got your everything together? You think that was the way to do it? What's that going to mean for your kingdom? What's good? I'm, I'm ashamed and embarrassed that you would stoop to that low. And here's David's answer. There was no performance in that. I wasn't performing for everyone, anyone. That was pure praise. Verse 21. First thing David says to Michal is not sorry. She, he corrects her. You're missing the audience to which I was dancing. It was before the Lord. And when I think about the Lord, I think about how he chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. I will celebrate the Lord. When I think about what the Lord has done, how he's chosen me, how he's brought me out of the muck and mire of my sin and set my feet on solid ground, how Jesus radically transformed my life, I will celebrate. Right? That's what it is. And if you think this is bad, it will get worse than this if the Lord sees fit. He is worthy, and I will become even more debased in your sight. 
Look at this. I will make myself yet more contemptible to this, and I will be abased in your eyes, but by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. He's saying, for the Lord, he's worthy to make myself even smaller for him. He is worthy to make myself even more lightly esteemed than I already am. What if we had a worship culture where we did not care about the person next to us when we were getting after the Lord? If you think about it, and you're not focused on yourself, one of the best things about worship is watching someone else worship the Lord hard. I mean, I love looking to my left and looking to my right and seeing people get after the Lord. And not, does it inspire you? Don't look with that judgy eye. They, they're probably just immature in their faith is why they're raising their hands. They were serious like me. Don't be that. Let's get after the Lord with everything in us. Here's the distinction between these two kingdoms. You've got the kingdom of Mashal, worried about externals, worried about performance, worried about the trappings of the reign of the king and the kingship and what that's supposed to mean. And then you've got David who goes, it doesn't matter if I'm a king or anyone else. First and foremost, I am a servant of the most high God. And he is worth lightly esteeming myself. He is worth being embarrassed by others in order that he might be magnified by my worship because he is worthy of it. What if we live that way? What if we as a people were that passionate my call to us is we are a people who would be Coram Deo people, a people who live before the presence of God and understand he's a holy God and how stunning is it that a holy God has brought us close, that we get to be in his presence and he prepares us for his presence by reminding us of his holiness so we would come in right posture to draw near to him in humble submission. And then when you realize you're in the presence of the most holy God, you realize Psalm 16 is true, that in his presence there is fullness of joy. So let's sing like it. Let's live like it. Let's be a people who live Coram Deo. Let's pray. Father, it is great to think about your word, to think about how it affects our worship, Lord, to think about how it affects the type of Christians we are. May it be a whole life adoration that goes to you, Lord. May you be honored in everything. May we live before your presence, under your authority, and to your glory. Father, I pray for those who don't know Jesus, that they, in hearing the gospel, would respond in faith in Jesus. They would run after Jesus. They would pursue him. They would Trust in him by faith that what he did by living for us, coming to earth and dying, excuse me, coming to earth and living a perfect life and then dying a substitutionary death was for their sin. And then rising from the dead, ascending to the right hand where he rules and reigns and acts as our intercessor and advocate for all who would put their faith in Jesus. God, I pray that you would grant the gift of repentance and faith to those who don't know you and the joy of worship to those who do. And I pray this in the great name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.